Welcome to Water of Life Online. We are so glad that you are tuning in for today's message. And you know, here at Water of Life, we believe in having passion for God and compassion for people. And so we're so glad that you're with us today. For more information about our church, from our service times, to the ministries we have available and more, you can check out our website at wateroflifecc.org. And of course, if you wanna stay connected with us throughout the week, make sure you follow us on our different social media platforms. Well, we're so glad that you're here. We hope that God speaks to you, that he encourages you, and we hope that you are blessed by today's message. Twenty twenty two. It really is just an amazing thing to be a part of. The, the the energy level, but to feel like you can actually make a difference in some of the kids and be a positive influence, even just for a small moment. We love you, Water of Life. Welcome to Trunk or Treat. First, just want to say thank you for all of you. How many went to Trunk or Treat? Okay, so like 10 of you all. The rest of you missed. There was about 15,000 people on our campus that night. It was amazing. That was just counting cars, counting people in lines. And it was like, wow, it was an amazing thing. So just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all of you who came out and made it happen. Over at Upland, we had like over 1,800 people attend there. We had 15 people pray to receive Christ. We had, it was just, we had a great outreach over there. We had, at Fontana, we had over five tons of candy given. So I'm not sure who's wearing that now, but um, okay. But no, and we had over a thousand people prayed for that night here. So way to go. And it's amazing. It's amazing, amazing, amazing. And then um, next week is Dollar Club. If you don't know about Dollar Club, Dollar Club for us at Water of Life is an opportunity to uh, just take a dollar and bless somebody in a huge way around the world. So we do that all over the world. This is gonna go to Bangladesh to feed kids that are starving. And so what we always do is show you directly people that got touched by your dollar and how big it can be to change their lives. Though it's very small for us, it's very big for them. So Father, we wanna come to you right now and say thank you God for kids. Thank you for an opportunity to open your word. Thank you, Father, that you bless and bring life to us over and over and over. And so often we miss you in the daily hustle and bustle and hurry and worry, God. We, we just miss you. And so we ask you, Holy Spirit, to open up the eyes of our heart. Help us to see you as you want to be seen today in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. okay, so you got a Bible, an iPad, a phone. Open to John chapter 13. If you haven't been with us, we're in the 13th week. I was studying the book of John, and last week we talked about Jesus' life in chapter 12, was in his very last week. Today, in chapter 13, we come to the very last night. So last week we said to you, what if you only had one week left to live, what would you do? Well, how about if we say this week, what if you only had 15 hours left to live, what would you do? How many know that would be a crazy thing, wouldn't it, to have to sort out what would you do with your time if you just had one night left? And Jesus knew 
it, within 15 hours, 20 hours, he was gonna be dead. He would be on the cross. And the reality was he took everything he had done for three years, as radical as that was, and he synthesized it into one night and he does five, and John, the book of John does five chapters on that one night. So chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 are all on one, what? <clears throat> one night, one night. Jesus' last night on the planet. So it's an amazing teaching. It's amazing, but it's just packed in with all kinds of wild, crazy, radical stuff. And it, we're gonna start there today. So it's like one of those things of just asking yourself, if you just had one night to live, I bet you wouldn't do what Jesus did. Because Jesus did some crazy stuff the last night he was alive. So let's start here by reading verse 1 and then verse 34 and 35. It's up on the screen if you're on the, on the campus or online. We want to welcome you. Let's read this loud and together. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you would also love one another. By this, all men or people will know that you are what? <clears throat> My disciples, if you have love for one another. So, 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 this is just a crazy thought because Jesus is really saying learning to love other people keeps you on the edge with your life with him. How many know it's hard to love people? <laughs> I have Christians tell me this all the time. Man, I love God, Pastor Dan, it's just people. <laughs> it's just hard to deal with people, you know? And, and how many of us have been hurt by other believers? And we've all, Listen, we all have a story, but Jesus said this, it's so important for you to know this, when you love other people, it defines you as a follower of Jesus. So he said, all the people will know that you are my followers or my disciples if you have love for other people. This is the mark. This isn't a mark, like with five other marks. This is the mark. What is the mark? Come on, tell me what the mark is of a, of a Jesus follower. What is it? That you would love other people. Uh, how many of you know this is hard? In fact, it's impossible. That's the whole chapter. It's like, it's impossible unless you surrender to God and let the Holy Spirit do a miracle inside of you. It's impossible to do this. But, 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 but watch this. Jesus doesn't ask you to do it. He commands you to. How many know that's, that's just wild? So, so you cannot command a feeling, friends, or an emotion. Like Jesus wouldn't have said this to you. You just need to love everybody. Oh, I don't feel it, you know, Lord said, I'm just, I go to work, I don't even like that girl two cubicles over. You know, I don't like that person in, the, in this class. I don't like that person in the neighborhood. And Jesus didn't say that. He said, listen, you can't command an emotion or a feeling, but you can't command an action. And friends, the truth is, when you start to follow, when, when you fall in love with Jesus and you start to serve people, then God will give you a heart that will follow your actions, your, your feet. That's what happens. How many of you know this is hard? But you, when you obey with your feet, then God will bring your heart and your emotions into line with that. But most of us just do this. I ain't doing that. You know, that, there's no way I'm going to be nice to that person. You know, you're like, you have no idea what they did to me. And I know, listen, I know you have a story. Jesus knew you had a story. And he still said, I'm not asking you to love one another. I am commanding you to do it. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm telling you, you've got to do it if you're going to follow me. So, 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 so what does that mean? It means Jesus doesn't just tell you what to do. He shows you how to do it. That's when this story just goes crazy. This is like such a wild event, we can't comprehend it. So Jesus is sitting at, at, at dinner. If you got your Bible, your iPad, a phone, let's read it together really quick. Let me read it with you. It says in verse one, now before the feast of the Passover, and we talked about Passover. Passover is like 4th of July for us. It's like, you know, celebrate independence, freedom, all of that. So a, thousand, a million to two million people would gather in, in Jerusalem for this event and they would celebrate getting set free from the, from the Egyptians and slavery. So here's Passover, and it says, Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he would depart out of the world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the what? Yeah. Literally, the word means to the, it's telos, it means to the utmost, all the way to the finish line, man. He never gave up on you. I say this to you every single week. God is crazy about you, even though you're just crazy. 
I mean, he's just, he will not give up on you, ever. God just doesn't give up on you. He just chases after you over and over. Have you noticed this? That's what makes Jesus so amazing. He just goes after people. We don't deserve to be chased down, but he chases us down anyway. And so he just goes after, after, after people. It says he loved them all the way to the end. And during the supper, this is, a, this is such a wild thing to try to comprehend. During the supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of who? Judas, the last night, Judas the traitor, into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was now gonna go back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded up himself. Okay, so, 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 so hold, hold it, you don't wanna miss this. It says clearly, <clears throat> Jesus knowing that the Father had given what into his hands? Everything. Oh, oh, hold it. What is everything? Come on, you guys are like big time theologians today. Help me here. What is everything? Is everything. So, 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 so hold it. Does that mean Jesus could have done anything he wanted to do in this moment? Any way that he wanted to do it? Yes or no? Total authority. He had total authority to do whatever he wanted to do. And he chose to get up from dinner the last night he's alive and wash Judas' feet. Come on, Judas Iscariot, who is gonna betray him and he was gonna be tortured and slaughtered in 15 hours. And Jesus got up from the table and washed his feet. Now I'm positive of something. A few minutes ago I asked you, I said, if you just had uh, one night left to live, what would you do? I am positive of something. Nobody in this room thought this. I'm gonna wash everybody's feet in my house. N nobody thought that thought. Nobody in, in the whole room thought this thought. Oh man, if I just had one thing left, I would wash everybody's feet in my family. No, you wouldn't. You didn't even think that thought. So you gotta ask yourself, what on earth was Jesus thinking? What is going on here? I mean, why in the world would he do, this was so shocking, so surprising. The, the, the disciples were just totally blown up. They're like, what? I mean, we've been with you three years, Jesus. You've just done some weird stuff in three years. You've shocked us so many times in three years, talking to Samaritan ladies and talking to people you shouldn't be around, hanging out with people you shouldn't hang out with. You shut, but you never did anything like this. Watch what happens. Gets up, it says, from the table, and he takes a towel, and he pours water into a basin, it says in verse five, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel. Now, do you think they were freaking out? I mean, they, have you ever been around a foot washing? You ever seen a foot washing or been part of a foot? It's awkward. I mean, it is just one of the most weirdest things that you've ever done, to touch somebody else's feet. Now, I know some of y'all have done this with your kids in the bathtub. That is not what we're talking about. You know, we were out at a powwow a few years ago. It's been many years ago, actually now, and uh, out in the desert. And we were, our church had gone out to serve these Native Americans. And we were like washing the dishes at the powwow and cleaning the toilets and doing all this stuff. And, and somebody came up with a bright idea that we should wash all of the chief's feet before we went home. Like, this is a bad idea. But how do you like be a good Christian and say this is a bad idea? Because Jesus did this, right? It's like, Jesus did this, we should do this. Okay, so we did. It was the most awkward moment in your life. You know, you just, it's so uncomfortable, so awkward. So here's Jesus. Jesus starts going around the room and washing their feet. Now, Peter, Peter's watching him go from one person to the next, and Peter's sitting there thinking what all of them are thinking, this ain't good, and this is not happening for me. You are not gonna do this to me, so watch what happens. Jesus comes up to Simon Peter after he's washed a few of the people's feet. We don't know how many. And, and Simon says to him, why, why did you, wa you're gonna wash my feet? What's this about? And in verse seven, Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand later, hereafter. How, how many know this is a God thing? This is how God works all the time. You don't know what he's doing right now, but if you stay in, he'll show you what he's doing when. Later, how many of you like this? Nobody. 
Nobody likes this, but friends, this is called walking by faith, not by sight. Amen. This is like you stay in when you don't get it, and then he reveals to you what he was doing later, and it supernaturally blows you up, and you're like, wow, I had no idea that's what you were doing. So he says to Peter, you have no idea what I'm doing right now. And Peter answers and said to him, you're not doing this with me, dude. This is not gonna happen. Never will you wash my feet. And Jesus answers him and said, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Now, the word Jesus actually used was inheritance. You don't have any, you're, you're out, dude, you are out. You have nothing to do with me if you don't let me do this. And Peter's like, whoa, that's a big deal. I mean, that's a big deal. After all these years, I've been following you and trying to do the right thing. And suddenly you tell me, if I don't let you wash my feet, I'm out. So Peter said, well, then let's just have a bath. I mean, this is just so Peter, right? I mean, you get Jesus in the room with Peter, you go, whoo, okay. So, so Peter says, then Lord, then just don't wash only my feet, but my hands and my head, everything. And Jesus goes, whoa, 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 dude, whoa. He who has, ba has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. And then listen to what he says, but not all of you. Who is he talking about? Judas. I mean, he's, he may have just washed Judas' feet. It's incredible to think that. For he knew the one who was gonna betray him. And for this reason, he said, you are not all clean. So after he washed their feet, he took up his garments and he reclined at the table and he asked them a question. Do you know what I just did? <laughs> yeah, they're all sitting there going, yeah, you just blew us up again, you know? Just did one of your Jesus things again and just blew us, we have no idea what you did. What were you thinking? Why were you doing this? That's a really important question to ask. The answer you would find is in Luke chapter 22, verse 22. It will tell you the story about the disciples that right at the end of Jesus' time, after three years of Jesus pouring his life into these guys, they were still arguing about who was the greatest in the whole bunch. Like who is gonna be in charge whenever Jesus takes over the Romans and kicks them out? Who's gonna be large and in charge? Who's gonna sit on the right hand and the left hand? Who's gonna get power and authority and possibility? That's all that mattered, the same things that often only matter to us. And really, come on, let's be honest, we all like to be in control. We do, we like to be in control. And that's what they were saying, they're like, I wanna be here, I wanna be here. She's like, wow, I put three years into you guys, we're right down to the clutch right now, we're at the very last night and you still don't get it. So let me explain something to you. This is all about humility. And Jesus is trying to help them figure this out. He, you know what's so great about humility? Is if you announce it, you don't have it. I mean, really. If somebody ever comes to you and goes, listen, I'm the most humble person you're ever gonna meet. <laughs> They're not, okay? So I mean, Jesus didn't announce it, he just did it. He just got up, he took off his robe, which was his rabbi authority, he set that aside, and he knelt down like a servant, a slave, and he starts washing their feet. This would have blown you to pieces. They were just completely freaked out by it, and literally he's saying this, listen, this is not about your place of honor. It's not about your title. It's about your heart. And you cannot be my disciple, my follower, unless you are humble. Come on, how many of you know that's hard? Because this is supernatural. There's none of us in the room that just like go, oh, I'm just, I love being humble. <laughs> that just doesn't happen for humans. The only way this happens is when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of your heart and pulls this, all this lurking junk out of you and puts his heart inside of you to care for other people. So you can't change and touch people, friends, unless you get underneath them and lift them up. And the word humble literally means to stoop low, to get low and pick up the people around you. And so Jesus said, look at what I just did. You don't understand what I just did. I just gave you this gigantic example of what it means to live in humility. So, 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 Matthew 11, 28, 29, Jesus said this. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, for I am gentle and humble in heart. I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Literally, I'm willing to get down on my knees to pick you up. I will stoop down and help you. Anybody know this God? 
Hello, anybody crashed into this and just been shocked at why would you serve me, Jesus? Why would you care for somebody like me? I can't get it. I don't know if you've ever thought that, but I've thought that too many times. A lot of times I thought, oh boy, why would you even be here? Why would you show any interest in me at all? Because see, it's not a natural thing for humans to be humble. It's a supernatural thing. Humility only comes about when you surrender to God and you allow the Holy Spirit in your business really deep, and I mean really deep. I mean where you just let God get in there and pull all this stuff out that's hiding in the closets for you and say, look it, I want to replace all of that with my heart. I want to replace that with my thinking. So that was a picture of him when he took off his authority and he, and he literally said, when you figure this out, then you're gonna start to live in destiny. And see, serving other people without humility and loving them is just a duty, friends. There's no destiny in it. Like when I ask you, come out to trunk or treat and help people, somebody like, you know, I love God, so I'll go, but I don't like the people here. You know, some of you think like that. You know you do. You know you do. Because sometimes it like pops out of your mouth, you know, and we hear you, woo, okay. So, you know, we're like, wow, you really don't like the people very much, do you? You know, how many of you know the mark of a, G of a Jesus follower is to what? Love other people. Jesus said that, not Dan. Jesus said that. Jesus said, here is the mark. A new commandment I give to you, that you would love one another, that you would love other people. So, so you got this crazy thing unfolding. And, and, and Jesus is trying to do something that is so hard. How, how many of you know if you were Peter and Jesus wanted to, it would be awkward for you. I mean, receiving from other people. How many of you know sometimes it's super awkward? It's hard to humble yourself and let somebody help you. Anybody know what I mean? It's just hard to do that. Some of us are like, huh, I gotta take care of myself. You know, I'm never gonna let, I don't need anybody else. Well, how many of you know everybody needs other people? Every, everybody needs other people. So here we go. Peter says, no, I'm not gonna do it. And then he says, yes, I'll do it. So when Jesus is all done, verse 12, he said, after he washed their feet, he sat down and he said, do you know what I just did with you? Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, I am. I just raised Lazarus from the dead, you know, I can do anything. If I am the Lord and the teacher, and I washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. And you know what's so amazing about this? He didn't say you should wash my feet too. He said you should wash each other's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave isn't greater than his master, nor is the one sent greater than the one who sent him. You know what he just said? Friends, if you're gonna serve me and be a Jesus follower, if you are literally giving up your rights and saying, I'm gonna take on your heart, Jesus. I'm gonna do what you want and you just told me what you want. You want me to humble my heart and care for other people. That is a, a reflection of the heart of the Father, friends. If you can't love other people, the Bible says clearly, then you can't love God. I'm gonna read that to you before we're done, but, 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 but you gotta figure this out. For some of you, just the thought of humility is like, no way, not happening. It's like a sign of weakness. Well, I'll tell you, in the spiritual realm, it's a sign of strength. It's pride that got Lucifer thrown out of heaven. And Jesus said, the only way you restore that is with the opposite spirit, is with the spirit of humility. Humility heals, friends, pride divides and hurts people. And humility heals. And Jesus said, listen, I want you to live with humility. Being vulnerable is not a weakness, it's a strength. Jesus was super vulnerable this night. I mean, he has one night left to live and he gets on the floor and starts washing their feet. It's a crazy picture. So, 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 so then he tells you what happens when you do this. Watch this. He said, you're, you're not greater than the master who sent you. If I did this, you gotta do this. Look at verse 17. If you know these things and, and, and you, are, you are blessed, if you what? Somebody, I know you got a Bible out there. If you know these things, you are blessed, if you what? If you do them. So, 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 whoa, hold it. What does that mean? It means if you don't do them, you're not blessed. Please, you gotta get that. I mean, I don't think there's anybody in the house here, I'm, I'm guessing, but I, there might be two of you, but most of us are here because we would like the blessing of God on our life. Is that right or not? 
We, we want God's blessing on our life. We're like, Lord, I need your touch on my life. Lord, I need your blessing on my life. How many of you know we're here because we want God's blessing on our life? Is that right or not? That's what we just did with these children. We just said, Lord, we want your blessing on their life. We believe that if we present kids to you, that you would bless them. Now, some of you don't get that, but you might if I put it this way. It's kind of like if you don't do it, you don't get blessed. It's like this. If we were having a satanic ritual and we brought all these kids up in front of a satanic altar and presented them before Satan, how would you be feeling inside? Would you be freaking out if somebody was doing that with their child, yes or no? Why would you be freaking out? Because you would be thinking, oh my gosh, what are they gonna do to that child? They're setting that child up for complete destruction. So why don't you think the opposite if we present them to Jesus? Why don't you think, look at them go. Man, they're presenting their kids before the God of the universe and look at them go because God's gonna do something supernatural in that kid's life because they did the right thing. And see, we just passed right by that, friends. Listen, you are blessed if you do it, but if you don't do it, you're not. You gotta get this. You gotta understand what Jesus is trying to say to you. If you obey, I will do something wild and supernatural for you. What does that mean? It's like happiness comes out of living in and out of humility and obeying the things Jesus is asking you to do. So there's like three key principles here I wanna touch on really quick. You gotta figure this out. Here's the first one, verses 12, 13, and 14. Just, Jesus just said, if I did it, you gotta do it. So there's no hierarchy. He just took it. You never graduate from serving, friends. You never graduate from serving. Some of us think, man, I'll serve right now for a while and then I'm gonna be large and in charge. I wanna get promoted, then I don't have to serve people anymore. In the Christian realm, friends, in the kingdom of God, you never graduate from serving. You're always supposed to what? Serve, you're supposed to help other people, serve other people. This is such an important thing because blessings come when you do what you're supposed to do. So what does that mean? It means just obey. I don't feel it, man. I don't want to talk to her. I don't want to be around that person at work. I don't like this person in my class. I can't stand my neighbor. You have no idea. Listen, I, know, I have an idea. Everybody in the house has a story. Jesus knew you would have a story, and he still said, love those people. In fact, he went so far to say this, love your enemies. Love your enemies, are you kidding? Yeah, no, I'm not kidding. It marks you out as a believer if you love people that you don't even like. And how many of you know this is supernatural? It doesn't happen naturally. So he says, listen, you gotta get around people and you gotta do the right thing. Get underneath them and lift them up. Second thing is verse 35. He says, when you serve other people, it's the key to penetrating the world. People will know you are my followers when you do this. And when we were in Israel a couple weeks ago, we were there on a tour. There were about 100 people in our group. And we had a guide that was, um, wow, he was an atheist and a bit of a train wreck. I mean, he was a good guy, a nice guy, but I mean, when he's on the microphone in the bus and he's talking about things, he goes, well, I don't know what the hell that is, you know, and I'm like, oh, dude. You know, really, do you need to cuss at it? You know, I'm thinking that, I'm the pastor, okay, so I'm thinking that. And, and, and the weirdest thing, I, I was, I was ready for this because this happened so many times. I was ready for people, oh, we don't want this guy in our bus, Pastor. We don't want, rah, rah, rah. I was ready. And that never happened. You know what happened instead? Every night, the people on our team gathered around that guy and just kept talking to him about Jesus. Kept talking to him about Jesus. Kept talking to him. Every single night at dinner, poor guy was overwhelmed. I mean, <laughs> people have prophetic words for him, dreams about him, everything. They're coming and telling him, God's telling him all this stuff. And, the guy's eyeballs are this big, you know, he's like, <laughs> what is happening to me? And then the last night, the last night he comes to me, this was wild, he comes to me the last night and he says, I need to talk to you. Man, I was so freaked out when I got this assignment. When they offered me this evangelical, this is the first religious tour I've ever done. I'm like, yep, I could tell that. And, <laughs> and you know, but, and, and he's like, and I was so freaked out because I've heard so many bad things about evangelical Christians from all my Jewish friends. And I, he's like a total atheist. He doesn't believe Judaism, nothing. He's got zero relationship with God. And he's like, I was so worried about being with you guys. And you know what? This was the craziest time I've ever had in my life. I can't figure you guys out. 
I mean, you're every different races, different ages, different socioeconomic group. And he went through all these things. And you're all nice to each other. That's what he said. No, he said that. He goes, you're just always nice to each other. I have never been with people like you, ever. And I thought, you know what? That's what Jesus said would happen if we loved each other. You would penetrate right into the heart of the world and people would see that you are different, that you are different. It was amazing. It was amazing to watch this happen. The third thing, there's no hierarchy, you always serve. And serving penetrates the heart of the world. And the third thing is this, when you serve, you get blessed. You'll be happier for it, friends. It'll bring life to you. You were created to serve other people. I know you don't like that. You're like, listen, in my world, if you have lots of servants, then you are large and in charge. In Jesus' world, you're not. In Jesus' world, you're called to serve other people to care for other people, get underneath other people and help them when they can't help themselves. So, so let's read this again together and we're gonna jump off the high dive for the last few minutes. It's gonna get hard. So um, I just get you ready for hard, okay? So let's read this again loud and together. It says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you would also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So, so, so Jesus just did this. He just took the 10 commandments and added one. Did he not? A new commandment I give to you. He said, so there's 10 commandments, but I wanna give you another commandment, and here it is. You gotta love each other. And if you do, you'll change the world. People will see that you are different. So, so what was so new about this? Because Jesus had been asked a question in Matthew 22, 39. He, the, he was asked this question, what are the two greatest commandments? And he said, very simple, love God and love other people. Love God and love other people. But then he took this on the last night he's alive and he like synthesizes it into this huge picture and says, you gotta get this before I'm gone if you don't do this, you will never be my followers. If you are a follower of Jesus, you've got to be a lover of other people. It's no longer an option. It is the only way forward. So, he said it this way. You need to love people like I loved you. And he washed their feet. He humbled himself. So let's talk about something that's happened in the last couple of years. You're all keenly aware of this. We went through COVID. I think COVID was like a test for us all. I think it was like a test. I think it was like, can I get you ready because things are gonna get harder for you and COVID is gonna be a test, not an easy test, very difficult test. I mean, many of us lost loved ones, we lost friends, we lost coworkers, we lost family members, we lost neighbors, we lost a lot of people during COVID. I remember when my daughter was at Loma Linda, working and she called me one day crying. She said, Dad, they just brought a freezer truck out in the back because the morgue is so full of people that there's no room for anybody else and they put a freezer truck out in back. And, and, she, and she was just so, sh everybody was so shaken. COVID was like a test. And during COVID, it was interesting to watch. It was sometimes very painful to watch. People, some people got really stretched out. I mean, we all did, didn't we? Hello? And we all got really, I mean, we were just so far out of our comfort zone. And some people rose up to the occasion. They served other people. They got underneath them and picked them up. It was amazing to go down to, to, to CityLink where we feed people and watch our people get in their cars during COVID with their masks on, load up food and drive from one senior's house to the other senior's house to the other senior's house, delivering food to people that couldn't get out of their houses. It was amazing to watch. And, and really an encouragement. But at the same time, I was watching all these other Christians that had fallen into fear. They were just terrified. They were like, oh, I'm not gonna survive this. This is not, no, 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 no. They were so discouraged. And I was like, what happened to us? Never in the history of Christianity had people reacted like we reacted during a plague or a, or a pandemic. Historically, Christians were the ones that always stayed during the plague and, and sat with people while they were dying. 
Christians were the ones who everybody else would run from the battle and Christians would run to the battle and say, I'm here, I'm in for eternity. I, I, I'm gonna care and love and serve people no matter what. I didn't see very much of that during COVID. I saw so many Christians that were tense and anxious and fearful, angry and afraid. And I was like, what happened to us? What, what happened to the mark? What was the mark? You would what? Love one another. What happened to the mark? I didn't see any mark. I saw lots of dissension, lots of anger, lots of frustration, lots of anxiety, lots of fear, but I didn't see the mark. Last year on Christmas Eve, I, was, I had COVID and I was having an infusion at a hospital, local hospital around here, where one of the doctors comes to our church. And he came to me and he said, I gotta, I gotta talk to you, because I'm really struggling. And, and I knew everybody was struggling. I mean, Jesus said this in John 16, I have told you all these things so that you would have peace in me. In the world, you're not gonna have any peace, but take heart, because I overcame the world. And, and, and so Jesus, like this last night he's alive, he was warning these people, I'm gonna go to the cross, it's gonna get dark out there, it's gonna be scary for you, but listen, listen, I'm still in control. I've never lost control. Trust me, even when you don't know what I'm doing, you will see later that it was me. I was still in control. But so many of us didn't. We didn't believe that. This word that Jesus used, he said, in the world you are gonna have tribulation. This is what we saw. I mean, this word is thalipsis in Greek. It encompasses a bunch of really bad stuff. Listen to the word Jesus chose. It means suffering of a pain or a wound. It means non-physical distress like anxiety and fear. It means constricting distress, things that will close in on you. Anguish, affliction, pain, cruelty, contempt, and concern. <gasps> Wow, Jesus, could you pick a nicer word, please? I mean, come on, how many of you know this is hard? COVID was hard. I'm not here telling you you shouldn't have been afraid. I'm not telling you you shouldn't feel anxiety. I'm not telling you it wasn't horrible. I'm telling you this, Jesus is bigger than that. And that's what he's trying to say. It was a test, friends, it was a test. And it's gonna probably in some of your lifetimes get way worse than COVID. And the question is, what marks you? What really marks you? Is it anxiety and fear? That doesn't mean you can't have those things. But when you have them, you need to run to God. You need to get on your face and say, Lord, help me. I don't love the people at work. I don't love these people that hold these positions. I don't love these people that act like this. I don't love them. Help me. I need you to put love inside of me. I need to do what you did. I need to obey and humble myself and care for people that I don't even like. Now this doctor, when he came in that day, and I'm having this infusion, and he's saying to me, I need to talk to you. I said, what do you need to talk about? He goes, just what's happened here. Because you know, I've told you how grateful I am that you kept the church open during COVID because people like me who were like first responders, he was in charge of the COVID response in his county. And he said, I couldn't survive without church because I, every day I saw people dying. Every single day I watched people die, every day. I needed healing, every weekend I needed healing. And I thought a lot of us felt that way. I mean, we had friends dying and we had people that we cared for dying. And, it was very, very difficult. And please don't hear me say anything but that. It was extremely difficult test, but it was a test. And he said to me, I need to talk to you about what's happening here with Christians. And I said, okay, talk to me. And he said, often I come into a hallway now and there's people screaming at each other. There's a patient yelling at a doctor or a nurse. So I walk down the hallway to talk to the people and try to cool this down and separate the people. And inevitably, when I'm there, the people will be screaming at the doctor or the nurse and they'll blurt out something like, I'm a Christian and I can't stand for you to do this to me. And he said, you know what happened here is almost every argument that I got into in the hallways here were with people who call themselves Jesus followers, Christians. 
He said, I don't see anybody walking in here loving people and being kind and thoughtful. I see Christians over and over yelling at people, screaming at people, venting their anger at people, blowing their top at people. And he said, I don't even know what to believe anymore. As a Jesus follower, he said, I don't know what to believe anymore because I don't see what Jesus would do here. I don't see that happening here. See, friends, that's a scary thing to hear. That's a scary thing to hear. Because see, Jesus never gave us like a comma where he said, love one another until it gets really hard and then you get a pass and you can just blow your top at everybody and I'll be okay with it. Because that's what Christians always say to me. Oh, Jesus gets it, he's okay. No, he's not okay. It doesn't mean you can't be human. It doesn't mean that you can't falter and fail. But listen, friends, you are supposed to be marked by love. We're supposed to be different than the world. We're supposed to be surrendered in our hearts to God. We're supposed to be people who cry out to Jesus when we're desperate and say, Lord, help me. I hate this person that lives down two blocks down from me or two doors down. I don't like this person at work. God, help me. I need to love the people you put in my journey. Jesus didn't just say to love people who are different than you or opposite of you or hold different positions than you. He said, love your enemy, people that are against you. I can't do that, I don't know about you, but I can't do that. That's supernatural. That cannot happen unless I'm on my face with God, unless I'm opening up to Jesus and saying, Lord, I can't do this. I can't get up another day. Do you know one, one week last year during COVID, we buried 11 people. In one week, we did 11 funerals here. In one week. There was so much death, we all felt it. But friends, it was a test and it wasn't a test that most of us passed. Galatians 5.22 says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. Self-control. Listen, it really goes like this. The, love of the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit is love, and love will look like this. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. When I lose control of myself, I should think this. I'm not where Jesus wants me to be. I need to get on my face before God and I need to go back and apologize to the people I spoke to. I need to do the right thing. Friends, we've all done the wrong thing and sometimes when you do the wrong thing then you have to get up and do the right thing. Pastor, that would be really hard. Oh yeah, it'd be very humiliating, wouldn't it? It'd be humbling. It's exactly what Jesus did. You humble yourself and you go to people and you say, I'm really sorry I treated you that way yesterday. I failed and I'm really sorry. And listen, friends, Jesus is always good with that. He's always good to receive you back after you failed. But it's not okay to rage on people and then say Jesus is okay with it. Because Jesus clearly said right here, I will mark you out by love. Listen to Matthew 24. When I tell you it's gonna get worse, Listen to what Jesus said, Matthew 24, seven. Nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. There's gonna be famines and earthquakes in various places, but all these things are just the beginning of birth pains. And because lawlessness will increase, most people's love will grow cold. Oh, because of lawlessness, because of things that are wrong. But the one who endures to the end is the one who will be saved. Jesus warned his followers that last night that it was gonna get really hard. And friends, he warned you and me that in the world we're gonna have struggles. But don't let it get inside of you. Don't let it corrupt your soul. Some of you spend every single day on CNN and Fox News. It's toxic. It's like turning on toxic waste and just drinking it all day. And then you go, I wonder why I don't love people more. <laughs> Hello? I mean, what if you read your Bible and worshiped some and prayed instead of going on the internet and reading the next thing? Because listen, I get it. It's enthralling. It's almost even addicting, but it, it kills your spirit. 
It kills the heart of God inside of you. If you live on that all the time instead of on the heart of God, friends, you're gonna manifest that. It's gonna be who you are. You got to live on Jesus. You gotta come back and back and back to God. I mean, when we're marked by judgment, are we really followers? I mean, ask yourself, what marks you? What marks me? I mean, when I heard him say that, I just went, I'm guilty of that. I've been really angry with people and I felt frustration. We all did, didn't we? But friends, we gotta feel conviction too. This is not okay to live there. Let's close up with this. This guy who wrote this book, John, he also wrote a couple of other books in the New Testament. And in 1 John chapter four, he explains what it looks like to be a, a follower of Jesus. In verse seven, it says this, dear friends, let us continue to love each other for love comes from God and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. And this is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to sacrifice for us to take us away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression through us. If somebody says, I love God, but hates another believer, that person's a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how could we love God who we can't see? And he's given us this command that those who love God must also love other believers. See, this text creates a real problem, doesn't it? Because loving is not an option or a suggestion. Jesus didn't say, hey, listen, I'm asking you to do something that's really cool. It'd be awesome for you. You gotta love the people around you. But if you're not comfortable with it, I get it. It's okay. <laughs> he didn't say that, did he? Last night of his life, what did he say? I give you a new commandment that you what? No. Love other people. Love the people around you. If you love me, love the people around you. See, here's the truth. Sin robbed the world of love and Jesus came to restore the impact of sin. In John 13, 34, when he said, now I'm giving you this new commandment, love each other, your love for one another will prove that you're my disciples. It, it is the mark of a Jesus follower. So it's so important for you to stop and just go, how am I marked? Am I marked by judgment, and anger, and frustration? I disagree with the people around me. I don't like what's happening in my culture, friends. It, we live in really difficult days. I was on the phone yesterday with an OBGYN at a local hospital here that you know this hospital well. And he said to me, Pastor, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I just got called and I was told that I will be asked soon meaning if Proposition 1 passes, this is what he was saying, his hospital called him and said, I will be asked soon to terminate live births. Yeah, let me explain what that means. A baby is born out of the birth canal, everything sitting on the table, completely 100% healthy, and I'm asked to give it an injection and kill it. Oh. This, friends, is called murder, and he was asked by his hospital so don't tell me this is a conspiracy or anything like that. This guy was called by his hospital and he said, I can't do that. As a Jesus follower, I can't do that. And they said, well, maybe we can make a concession for you so you won't have to treat those people. And he said, help me, Pastor Dan, what would you do? That would be like in OR3, they're terminating the life of this little baby and I'm in OR4 thinking it's okay. That would be like if the Nazis were gassing Jewish people in OR3 and then they're asking me to be in OR4 and be okay with it. And he said, I don't think I can be a doctor anymore. This is a person who's given his whole life to his career. And he said, I don't think I can do this anymore in our culture. So do you feel what I feel? I feel anger about that. I feel like how did we get here as a culture that we would now say it's okay to terminate a live birth, murder a baby that's sitting on a table? How did we get there? I don't, I, I, listen, I'm positive of this. I hate this, but I have to love people. It's not an option. 
I have to love people that I see as my enemies, people I don't agree with. I have to be kind to those people. I have to be thought, listen, listen, when John said this, he was so clear about this. He's like, you've got to figure this out. You have to be marked by this, but it's impossible without the Holy Spirit. It's about, friends, it's about generosity. Here's what we think. Generosity is about money. No, no, no. Generosity is about love and kindness and forgiveness and healing and still being nice and disagreeing. What Jesus was a master at is never giving in to sin and things that are immoral and wrong. He never surrendered to that, but he always was thoughtful and kind to people. This is wrong, but I still love you. You can do this, but it's supernatural. It's gotta be driven by the Spirit of God, friends. It can't happen under your own power, your own authority. It's gotta be driven by the Spirit of God. You can be nice and still be firm. Romans 2, 4 says, says this, it says the kindness of the Lord leads people to repentance. Not screaming at them, being angry at them, but being kind to them. Romans 5, 5 says this, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. The love of God is poured out in my heart, how? Through the Holy Spirit that's given to us. It is a Holy Spirit driven proposition. I have Christians say things like this to me. Well, it's, it's okay if they do that because I can't judge them. Oh, no, 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 no. No, this isn't judgment. This is really clear in the word of God. Murder is wrong. This is not okay. Immoral things are wrong. This is not okay. But that doesn't mean you have a license to hate the people. It means you still love people even though you disagree with what they're doing. You're kind to them even though you don't understand why they hold the positions they hold. You're loving even though you don't feel like being loving. Listen, we'll close here, but this is so important that you figure this out. Andrew Murray in his book called, called Absolute Surrender, he tells a story about a lamb and a wolf. And he said this. He said, Does it, is it work for a lamb to be nice and gentle? He said, no, it's never worked for a lamb to be nice and gentle because lambs are just by nature nice and gentle. And he said, how about a wolf? Is it hard for a wolf to want to eat a lamb? No, no, it's just in its nature. Wolves like to eat lambs. So it's in its nature. And he said, and so should it be for you Christians to love other people. It should be your nature. It's not something that you choose to do. Or you choose. It should be you're so changed from the inside out that you love people. Even when it breaks your heart, you still love people. That, that's the picture here. And the reality is, you know, there's so much drama in the news, everyone. It just excites you, it creates, they do that on purpose, by the way, so you keep coming back. That's why I said it's toxic and addictive, but it's not life-giving. You can't love if you live in fear every day, friends, and insecurity. You can't love if your foundation is fear. You gotta live in Christ every day. You gotta allow God to guard your heart, your mind. He alone has the answers to the struggles in the world. Now, now listen, we're done. This is how you do this. There's, a, there's actually a picture in the Bible how you do this. It's in Colossians chapter three, verse one. It says, since you've been raised to life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Set your sights, so, 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 so. Let me explain that word to you really quick. It means literally take time to think about this. Set your sights on heaven, take time. How many of us really take time to think about that? We take time to watch the TV, turn on the internet, do all these other things, but how many of us take time to think, what does Jesus want us to do right now? Set your, 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 your mind on things above, Paul says, so watch this. Where Christ sits in heaven at the right hand of the Father in a place of honor and power, let heaven fill your thoughts, not box or CNN. Okay, do not think only about the things that are here on earth. For you died when Christ died and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. You're an eternal person if you're a Jesus follower. And when Christ who is your real life is revealed to the world, you will share in his glory. So listen, listen, listen. Put to death the sinful earthly things that are lurking within you. <laughs> yeah, those things that kept jumping out at the hospital, you know, and causing people to get in fights and scream at each other. They're evil things lurking within all of us. How do you do that? 
Well, here he goes, have nothing to do with sexual sin, impurity, lust, shameful desires. Don't be greedy for more stuff in this life because you, it'll become idolatry for you. But here's what you do. Now is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior and slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other anymore because you took off all your old nature and all of its wickedness. And in place of that, clothe yourselves with a brand new nature that is continually being renewed as you learn more and more about Christ who created this new nature inside of you. The word is in duo, clothe yourself. It literally means to sink into something and have it just close over you. So it'd be like this, if you were, if you put on a gown, ladies, and it was just such a magnificent thing, it just like took over your person. You know, and, and if you were a guy, you got all styled up, and yes, you were surprised everybody because you look so good, and you, and you thought, wow, what happened? You got clothed in something that just took over your whole personality, your identity. That's the picture here, that you sink into something so deep that it just surrounds you. And he said, when that happens, You'll be clothed with this new identity of creating a new nature inside of you since God chose to be the holy, chose you to be holy people whom he loves, you must enduo yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You must make allowance for other people's faults and forgive people who offend you. <gasps> Hello? How many know this is really important? Forgive people who offend you. Why should you do that? Because God has done that for you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive other people. And the most important piece of clothing you can slip on is love. You gotta wear love. Love is what binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ ruling in your hearts rule over you as members of one body. You're called to live in peace and always be grateful to God. So here you go. Last January, I was in Montana, I was hiking up on this mountain right here. And you see it's really rocky, but that's the side that was in the sun. And the path went down one side of the hill and then jumped over to the other side. And when you crossed over to the other side, it looked like this. There was snow everywhere. So it went from one side with lots of snow to the other side with lots of rock. Well. This is way, just right on the edge of Yellowstone Park. I'll show you a picture here. You can see you're looking at Yellowstone Park out there. It's like way on the other side of those mountains, but it's, it was a magnificent place. But I, I'm not like the brightest bulb in the bunch. So when I'm walking, I got my boots on. And when it crosses over to the ice and the snow, how many of you know you fall down? Hello? And, and like you look over the edge sometimes and it's a long ways down and you're thinking, oh, I just about died, okay. So this is not very smart, I'm kind of stupid. And especially because I, I, I'm walking in the snow and I have something in my backpack that could help me if I would just stop and slip it on. It's called micro spikes, these are micro spikes. So you just slip them over your boots and voila, presto, you can walk on the ice and not fall down and break your head. So I was smart enough that I finally stopped and put them on. And then I started walking and I thought, you know what's so weird about this? I don't feel afraid of falling over the edge anymore because I have a new foundation. That's what Christ is trying to say to some of you. You live in fear because you don't stop and in duo. You don't, you don't slip into the heart of God and let the heart of God overwhelm you. When you get a foundation in Christ, friends, you don't have to live afraid anymore. You just get up and walk, and it becomes natural for you. Is this a hard message? Yeah, I, it is. I mean, some of you are like, holy Toledo's, I'll never do a baby dedication at that church again. You know? <laughs> I was trying to be a good family member, thought I'd show up there, and I got my hair buzzed off, you know? I, I, I understand that, but let me explain something to you. We're not here to build a big church. We're here to build big disciples. Followers of Jesus, that, that's always the goal. The goal was never to get big. The goal was always to build hearts inside of people that would love God and love people. So I want you to stand with me, would you? Some of us, it's so important for us to take account before the next whatever comes, because it's coming. I don't know what it looks like, but it's coming. And I know this, that Jesus wants to mark you out as a follower by love. 
So Father, we come to you right now and we say, God, help us. We're in desperate times and we need to be desperate people. We need to bow down before you. Lord, we need to let you have your way in us. So I pray for us as a church, people that are visiting, people are online, people that are on other campuses, God, that you would grab a hold of our hearts, Father, and say, listen, let my love mark your journey, even when you don't like the people, even when you don't agree with the people, even when they're your enemies, still love them like I love you. Father, teach us how to not yield to sin and compromise, but still be kind to people. Help us, Holy Spirit, to slip into you and let you clothe us with a supernatural possibility of loving people in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. I'm sorry I kept you so long today. God bless you. There'll be people up here to pray for you. If you would like prayer, come on up to the front. Well, wasn't that a great message? You know, I say this all the time, but our hope here is that you wouldn't just receive information, but that you would experience transformation. And so we hope that you were transformed and challenged and encouraged by today's message. Like we mentioned, if you wanna find out more ways to get connected to Water of Life, make sure you check out our website, wateroflifecc.org. But other than that, we love you guys. We hope you have a great week and we can't wait to see you next week at Water of Life.